Good evening, everybody, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on career pathways to becoming a Supreme Court Justice. My name is Vicky Fox, and I'm the CEO at the court. We have several hundred people attending, and I know that some of you will already be very familiar with the role of the Supreme Court, and they already hold judicial office. Others may be just starting on their legal careers. For those of you who are less familiar with our work, you can find out more on our website and also sign up to our new free online course, which takes you behind the scenes at the Supreme Court. This evening, we're looking at how you can become a justice. The purpose of the webinar is to provide an opportunity to learn more about the appointment process and what it takes to become a well-qualified candidate, enabling all aspiring future justices to start to think about long-term career planning. We're interested in attracting the very best people to become justices and believe that attracting, developing and retaining a, di a diverse judiciary is essential to the court and the public that we serve. Our panellists tonight are Lord Reed, Liz Burnley and Lady Rose. They're all uniquely qualified to provide advice on career planning and will all be speaking before we open up to Q&A. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions. So please, um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, add them um, in the uh, Q&A button, which is speech marks with a little question mark in. Um, all attendees are muted and can't be seen by others and your questions will be asked um, anonymously. So please don't be shy about asking us anything that you'd like to know. Without further ado, let me introduce Lord Reed. Lord Reid took up appointment as President of the Supreme Court in January 2020. Prior to his appointment as President, Lord Reid served as Deputy President from June 2018 and was originally appointed as a Justice in 2012. He studied law at Edinburgh University and undertook doctoral research in law at the University of Oxford. He qualified as an advocate in Scotland and as a barrister in England. He practiced at the Scottish Bar in a wide range of civil cases and also prosecuted serious crime. He served as a senior judge in Scotland for 13 years, first as a member of the Inner House of the Court of Session and then as a member of the Outer Hall House of the Court of Session, where he was principal commercial judge. As well as sitting on the Supreme Court and the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, Lord Reid is also a member of the panel of ad hoc judges of the European Court of Human Rights and is a non-permanent judge of the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong. Lord Reid, let me hand over to you. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, the first point I'd like to make is that appointment to the Supreme Court is on merit. It's essential that the court should attract the best qualified candidates for appointment uh, that it possibly can. As the president of a court, I want the most talented people to be able to become justices of this court, whatever their social or educational background, their gender or their ethnicity. My second point is that being a justice of the Supreme Court is not an entry level judicial post. The role is too important for an initial tryout of how somebody performs as a judge. The court is the highest rung on the senior judiciary ladder, which starts at the High Court and progresses from there to the Court of Appeal uh, in England and Wales and Northern Ireland and the equivalent Scottish courts. So the strongest candidates for appointment to the Supreme Court usually come from the rung below the Supreme Court or occasionally the rung below that. They have exceptionally been candidates appointed who were not already full-time members of the senior judiciary, but they had already served for many years as part-time judges. So they too had a proven track record on the bench. So if your ambition is to be a justice of the Supreme Court, you're well advised to apply first for appointment as a high court judge and then progress upwards. But in reality, you need to think about your career from a much earlier stage, in particular 
about how you go about acquiring the necessary skills and experience to serve on the country's highest court. Thirdly, as we all know, the higher courts are often criticized for a lack of diversity. Change depends on encouraging a more diverse group of people, not only to consider becoming judges, but to organize their careers in a way which makes that a realistic ambition. The court can't address all the difficulties which may prevent people from progressing, but we can help to remove some barriers, one of which may be a lack of knowledge as to how best to plan your career. Of course, being a Supreme Court judge would not suit all judges, let alone all lawyers. And if you are the sort of person who would love this job, you'll probably gravitate naturally towards the career path which tends to develop the skills and experience that are needed. But advice and encouragement can help, and that is what we want to give today. The first thing you need to consider is whether this is something you would actually want to do. If your primary motivation is money, then this job is not for you. Uh, a barrister or solicitor who is good enough to be appointed as a senior judge could almost certainly earn more in private practice. If your leisure time is of central importance to you, then again, this job is not for you. Justices work very long hours at an age when many people have retired. If you're looking for a job full of human interest, then I'm afraid this probably is not for you either. We only take cases which raise difficult points of law, and our only objective is to clarify those points of law. So we spend our days hearing legal arguments, and we spend our evenings and weekends reading for the next cases and writing our judgments, which are long essays on points of law. Many people, I'm afraid, would find that an arid way of life. On the other hand, if, like me, you find the law of, absor of absorbing interest and enjoy spending a lot of time studying it, studying it and writing about it, and if public service is important to you, then you may well be the sort of person who would enjoy the job. How then should you plan your career with a view to one day being a senior judge? First, you will want to get experience of litigation. The Supreme Court is a court, of course, and it hears oral argument in public. The justices need to be able to manage a court, to direct and control the discussion with counsel, to cope with all the random events that are liable to happen in a live hearing before members of the public. To do that, we need experience of litigation. It's also an advantage to have experience of litigation when applying to become a High Court judge. Secondly, you'll want to develop the skills that are needed to work on this court. Skills of legal analysis, of thinking through new legal problems in terms of the conceptual structure of the law and doing so quickly and decisively. This is an intellectual job. Only people who have strong analytical and logical skills, the ability to write clearly, the capacity to work in a wide range of areas of the law, and the ability to work collegiately as a member of a team can do it successfully. So you need to think about whether you will develop those skills if you pursue a particular line of work. You're most likely to develop the necessary skills through experience of dealing with the sort of legally difficult issues that come before this court. Thirdly, it's important to get experience as a part-time judge before applying for a permanent position. But if you're aiming for the higher courts, you want to get that part-time experience at a suitably senior level perhaps as a deputy high court judge uh, or a tribunal judge at the appellate level. There are other points that I could make, uh, for example, about the value of speaking at conferences, of writing for legal journals, of acting as standing counsel or as a member of the attorney general's panels and of experience on the law commission or experience as a judicial assistant. But I've said enough for the moment 
and I'll hand back now to Vicky. Thank you, Lord Reed. And um, if you want to find more uh, more out about our becoming a judicial assistant here, again, we've got information about that on our website, and we recruit every year, um, starting around February. I'm going to hand over to our next speaker now, uh, Liz Burnley, CBE. Liz is a lay member of the Judicial Appointments Board for Scotland. She has a professional background in organisational psychology in the manufacturing and retail sectors and has worked in consultancy, human resources and general management in the UK and overseas. Liz served as a non-executive director in the health sector and also as a lay member and chair of fitness to practice hearings for medical regulators. Liz has extensive experience as a member and chair of charity trustee boards. Liz, let me hand over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Vicky. So I'll be giving you an overview of how the selection process for appointing justices of the Supreme Court works and what we're looking for uh, from applicants in perhaps a little more detail. So justices are selected in accordance with the provisions of the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 and for each competition a selection commission is convened by the Lord Chancellor and chaired by the President of the Court. This includes um, a senior judge and members of the Judicial Appointments Commissions in England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. At least one of the members is a lay person and indeed in some recent commissions lay members have made up the majority on selection commissions. It's this selection commission that determines the specific selection process within the framework set out in the legislation and as far as potential candidates are concerned that starts with the issuing of an advert and an information pack and this gives details of the criteria for appointment and also the process that will be followed. So let me talk a little bit about what the selection commission is looking for um, from applicants. So as Lord Reed said, the overriding uh, criteria for selection is, is on the basis of merit and the information pack will explain the specific criteria that the Commission is looking for and how merit is assessed. The first expectation is that applicants have, as Lord Reed said, substantial uh, judicial or equivalent experience. There are a number of statutory eligibility requirements which outline the experience which is required and this includes having held high judicial office for at least two years or satisfying the judicial appointment eligibility condition or having been a qualified practitioner for at least 15 years and these are defined in the Act. The cases dealt with by the Supreme Court and the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council include the most complex and important in the courts in the United Kingdom and as such they of course demand the deepest level of judicial uh, knowledge and understanding combined with the highest intellectual capacity. However that in itself is, is not enough. There are also additional criteria which are assessed in order to look at the merit of candidates and these cover both legal and also personal and judicial qualities. So merits assessed holistically uh, across a number of aspects and applicants will be expected to demonstrate these to an exceptional degree. And what I'll do now is just run through what these areas are. Um, the, the first one is intellectual capacity, knowledge and expertise. So this looks at intellectual and legal ability and what we're looking for candidates um, to have is a significant capacity for analysing and exploring legal problems creatively and flexibly together with an appreciation of the role of the court in contributing to the development of the law. 
we're looking for evidence of, of knowledge and experience across a range of legal areas and the ability to address problems in unfamiliar areas of the law. Candidates, as Lord Reid mentioned, must demonstrate clarity of, of thought and expression. Uh, and a particular consideration for this is in written work. They also need to show uh, an appreciation of the developing nature of the, the constitution and law throughout the United Kingdom. If I move on now to judicial and personal qualities, this area is about the style that the candidate would bring to a judicial role, where the, the task is, is about judging rather than, for example, um, advocating. So we're looking for candidates to show um, integrity and independence of mind, sound judgment, objectivity and decisiveness. They need to show an ability to contribute to the collegiate decision making of the court and to be able to work collaboratively and create an inclusive environment. You will realise there's a need for candidates to demonstrate they're able to work under pressure uh, and to produce work in a timely way. Also important is self-awareness and the capacity to develop uh, in, in response to that. Examples that candidates give us during the selection process don't always have to have perfect outcomes, but what's important is, is how they've learned from a particular experience. The next area is around understanding and fairness, and we need Supreme Court justices to have sensitivity to the, the needs of different communities and groups and the ability to consider difficult and often sensitive issues fairly and dispassionately. It's also important that candidates can demonstrate an understanding of the role of the Supreme Court in the Constitution and its relationship with Parliament, the executive and the rest of the judiciary. The final area is communication skills and perhaps it goes without saying that excellent written and oral skills are required um, but alongside that an ability to work courteously in and out of uh, court respecting the views of others. Other aspects of communication include the ability to engage in the wider representational and leadership role of a Supreme Court justice, for example, delivering lectures, participating in conferences, talking to students and um, to other groups. <clears throat> and of course, a willingness to embrace new technologies is a requirement in the role. So as you'll see, intellectual and legal skills of the highest order are clearly critical, but not in themselves sufficient for Supreme Court appointments. We're looking for judges who can deal with very complex and high profile cases and produce timely judgments of the highest quality, but also be able to demonstrate more personal skills and qualities, which all go together to make a rounded and high performing Supreme Court justice. So let me turn finally to how the Selection Commission assesses these criteria and how it assesses merit. So candidates are asked to complete an application form and uh, a monitoring form. They need to provide um, a CV and a short supporting statement, which gives clear evidence of how they meet each of the specific criteria for appointment. Candidates also need to su submit um, a number of significant pieces of writing that demonstrate their breadth of experience and ability to address legal problems in different areas of the law um, and also to demonstrate how they meet the additional criteria for appointment. Candidates uh, must provide names of, of two people who can provide an independent assessment against these additional criteria. Before shortlisting, the Commission uh, undertake statutory consultation uh, and indeed a second statutory consultation is undertaken 
by the Lord Chancellor uh, when he or she receives the recommendation from the Commission. Shortlisted candidates are invited to interview uh, wherever possible in person, but of course that's subject to any uh, pandemic related government guidance. The interview explores in depth all aspects of, of how the candidate demonstrates that they have the skills and qualities required. So I hope I've been able to give you an overview of the criteria we're looking for and the way these are considered in, all, in order for this selection commission to assess the overall merit of candidates. Thank you very much. So I'll pass back at this stage to Vicky. Thank you very much, Liz. And we'll hear from our third panellist now, Lady Rose. Lady Rose became Justice of the Supreme Court in April 2021. Um, she took her first degree at Cambridge and a postgraduate degree at Oxford. Uh, Lady Rose was called to the bar in 1984 and was in private practice for 10 years. Then she left private practice to join the Government Legal Service, holding a number of interesting roles that I'm sure we'll be hearing about when she speaks. In 2006, Lady Rose was appointed to her first judicial role as a fee paid chairman of the Competition Appeal Tribunal, and she went on to be appointed to further tribunal posts before joining the High Court in 2013. And she was appointed to the Court of Appeal in January 2019. Lady Rose, let me hand over to you. Thank you very much, Vicky. Uh, my remarks are primarily aimed at potential applicants who are having or who hope to have a legal career involving roles outside the traditional role of being a court based advocate in private practice. And as, as Vicky has, has suggested, I myself have had a, a varied career in the law. I started out in private practice as a barrister in London, but after 10 years, I decided to leave Chambers and I joined the Government Legal Service and I worked there for about 12 years. I spent the first five years in the Treasury, working mainly on the legislation that became the Financial Services and Markets Act. And then I spent about four years in the Ministry of Defence and three years in the House of Commons Legal Department. Uh, and my work in the government legal service was uh, entirely advisory work rather than working in the Treasury solicitors litigation section. But inevitably, I got involved in some very important legal disputes and in fact instructed some of the le leading barristers of the day who have since become my colleagues as judges. Uh, when I stopped uh, practicing uh, as a barrister in 1995, my one regret really was that at that time it meant that I would never become a judge because this was before the uh, Judicial Appointments Commission was set up. And in those days, the appointment of judges, particularly to senior roles like the High Court, was done by the old tap on the shoulder system. That is to say, the Lord Chancellor of the day would simply contact one of the leading barristers and invite them to become a judge. And nobody who was doing the tapping would know about me or my shoulder whilst I was in the government legal service. But when the Judicial Appointments Commission was set up, uh, there was a big push also to widen the pool of potential candidates who could be appointed to be judges. And owing to the foresight and the determination of uh, Dame Juliet Weldon, who was then the Treasury Solicitor and head of the government legal department, the rules were changed and the pool was expanded so that lawyers working in the government legal department were eligible. And I knew as soon as that happened that I wanted eventually to become a High Court judge. But at that point, I was a grade five advisory lawyer in the Ministry of Defence. And though that was a very fascinating and worthwhile role, it wasn't a very good jumping off point from which to think about achieving uh, what had then become my ambition. So I had to set about redirecting my career towards the High Court. And it took me about eight years of fairly careful planning from 2005 until about 2012 for me to get into a position when I could successfully apply to be a full time High Court judge in the Chancery Division. 
So what were the elements of that plan? The main thing was to get myself into a position to apply, uh, as Lord Reed has said, for a part time judicial role at an appellate level. And one of the best ways uh, of doing this for someone coming up a non-conventional route is to apply to be a judge in a specialist tribunal. There are tribunals dealing with all sorts of particular areas of the law, so it helps if you can become familiar with one of them, and then it makes sense for you to have that as your first career uh, experience of judging. So the first step in my career reorientation was to move to work part time in the government legal service by getting a three day a week role. And at the same time, I applied for a part time role as a judge in the competition appeal tribunal. Uh, competition law was the area of law that I had specialized in when I was in practice. So that was a, a clear natural first step. Uh, I had to put in uh, quite a lot of work to update my level of knowledge as to what had happened in competition law during the years I'd been in the GLD. And I then juggled between my job as a legal advisor in the House of Commons for three days a week with working as a tribunal judge for about three years. And that enabled me to explore whether I liked being a judge and whether I was any good at it. And then gradually the tribunal work expanded as I applied for other fee paid judicial roles in other judicial um, uh, areas such as charity law and environmental law. And I also applied to sit part time as a Crown Court judge, as a recorder, presiding over criminal jury trials. And having expanded my portfolio of fee paid judicial roles, that enabled me finally to leave the government legal department in 2008 and spend a few years just building up my experience of judicial work by sitting as much as I could. So let me uh, talk about some points that anyone who is thinking about a career in the judiciary should bear in mind. First, the judiciary is much more open now uh, to people who have had varied careers like mine, or who have spent all or part of their careers as solicitors or as in-house lawyers. So make the most of all the opportunities that there are around to have an interesting legal career in a number of different ways. And in fact, as, as Liz Burnley said, one of the qualities that the appointments commissions are always looking for, and which is really important for a judge, is the ability to pick up new and unfamiliar areas of the law quickly. And I certainly had plenty of experience uh, that I could draw on for that from my career moving about uh, government legal departments. But secondly, there's a conundrum which it's important to recognise, I think, and that I realised that I faced when I was working in the GLD. And that is that you need to achieve a certain level of seniority and experience in your organisation, whatever that organisation is, in order to be a credible candidate for a senior role. But you also need to maintain a large legal content to your day to day work. So I realised that if I had applied for promotion to a higher civil service grade when I was in the government legal service, the percentage of my work that would actually remain the law would drop and I would be replaced by managing teams of people, discussing and managing budgets, considering the future strategy of the organisation. And that would have taken me further away from my ultimate goal. And it's interesting that the other person from the government legal service who's been appointed to the High Court, this is Justice Collins Rice, occupied one of the very few senior government lawyer roles that still retains primarily a legal content. And finally, I would say if you're thinking about the uh, judiciary as a career, it's never too early to explore the uh, Judicial Appointments Commission website. There's a lot of material there about seminars and mentoring programmes that they run that help people with the application process at, at all levels of the judiciary. And those are particularly aimed at people from underrepresented groups. So my advice would certainly be to explore that, look at the very wide range of opportunities that there are and the help that's given to people to make sure that when you are ready, you are able to put the best application possible in to uh, support your uh, future career. Thank you. Back to you, Vicky.
Thank you, Lady Rose, and thank you to all three of our panellists for your opening remarks, which already have provided lots of tips and help. Um, what you've said has sparked lots of questions. I'm going to do my best to try and get through all of them um, in the time that we've got left. Let me start with um, one question here, which is, um, and I think I'll start with you, Lord Reed, with this question. Would the panel be able to suggest any extracurricular activities that they feel may help in developing the right skills? <laughs> well, um, I think a wide range of activities can develop the right skills. Um, let me give uh, an example. We have at the moment a justice who is very keen on sailing. Now, I'm sure in terms of character, uh, sailing may benefit you in all kinds of ways, but it also uh, has given him a great enthusiasm for sitting on our shipping cases and uh, marine accidents, for example, he's, uh, he's, he's very interested in sitting on and he knows rather a lot about it. Unlike the rest of us, he can actually read uh, maritime charts. Um, so that's that's one example. I'm interested in history and if you're doing our job, it's it's very important to be able to understand how the law has developed and to be able to place precedents in their context and un understand, have some awareness of the social attitudes and social structures and so forth that were in place when a case was decided and how um, modern society may have changed in ways which diminish the persuasiveness of the precedent. So. An awareness of history is an important, um, important facet of, uh, of, of uh, any senior judge, I think. Um, I think it's, it's important to be able to relax. Um, you know, in a job like ours, you can, it's all too easy to find that you're thinking about absorbing problems when you're having dinner with your wife in the evening and you're still, your mind is actually still revolving around the problem while she's speaking to you and you're having difficulty focusing on what she's saying to you. Um, so I think the, the ability to be able to switch off and do something else, whether it's sailing, reading, uh, squash or golf or whatever it is you're interested in, ballroom dancing, um, I think to have some um, Something you're keen on in your spare time is important and some things, as I, I've suggested, may be helpful, but um, I think the more important thing is that you've got something to, to switch off and do. Thank you. Um, Lady Rose, let me pass to you next. Yes, I, I would add two things to that. As Liz Burnley mentioned, one of the things that the court is, is looking for, and in fact is important in any judicial role, is an awareness of the different communities that uh, the court serves. And there are a lot of people who apply for judicial post whose careers have been entirely in the commercial sphere, whether as commercial barristers or working in uh, commercial solicitors offices uh, or as an in-house uh, lawyer in a big uh, company. And uh, a lot of the applications uh, that I see in my work for the JAC, the way that people demonstrate that aspect of their personality is through their extracurricular activities, particularly if they've been involved in uh, giving advice at a citizen's advice bureau or voluntary work um, in a charity. Uh, with asylum seekers or with uh, a school that is operating in a difficult area and has has a community aspect to it. So that that's an important way in which you can not only do valuable work for its own sake, but it is a way that gives you that experience of dealing with people outside who are different from the people you generally meet in your work environment. Uh, and the other interesting thing that uh, people tend to do is really anything that gives you a sort of quasi judicial experience. So, for example, some people become governors of a school where their, their children are uh, attending and any role in which an important part of it is 
listening to two sides of an argument and having to come to a decision, even if it's not a really judicial role as such, that kind of experience not only helps you to decide whether you like doing that kind of thing, but is also a useful experience that you can draw upon when you're looking for examples as to how you demonstrate that you have a particular competence when you're coming to fill in your application form. Thank you. And Liz, in your role at the Judicial Appointments Commission, you must see many candidates. Um, what caught your eye about extracurricular activities? Well, I mentioned that one of the um, one of the things that's important is is about self awareness, and I think it's really helpful when people can describe things that they've been involved with and things that they've done, but importantly, what they've learned from that um, and how they've applied that. Um, so I think I think self-awareness can come from all aspects of life, uh, extracurricular activities of various forms. Um, it, it's often the case that an example from another part of, of life, apart from work life, can be really, really useful um, in, in helping someone to demonstrate what their skills and qualities really are. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. Now, this is a question about legal, legal academics and solicitors, and perhaps I'll turn to you, Lord Reid, first on this. And the question is, can legal academics arrange their careers in such a way that a move into judicial roles is possible? And historically, it's been less common for solicitors to sit in the senior courts. Do you think that's still the case? And what tips might you have for solicitors trying to move into judicial roles? Well, considering first legal academics, um, we've, we've experienced, of course, on this court of a legal academic uh, joining the court directly at this level, uh, Professor Burroughs, now Lord Burroughs, now, he, what he did by way of arranging his career was he worked as a, a, a recorder um, for 18 years before joining the court. And he also worked as a deputy high court judge. Now, he was, I suppose, in the fortunate position of being uh, at a stage in his academic career when he didn't have teaching responsibilities. Um, but that wouldn't have been true when he first became a recorder. Uh, he wouldn't have been that senior in academic at, at that stage. Um, but he was able, obviously, to get the agreement of the university where he taught um, to do part time judicial work. And that, I think, was vital to his being able subsequently to apply uh, for a judicial post. Of course, there have also been legal academics who have decided to change careers. Um, Lord Lloyd Jones, for example, who's the number the third most senior member of this court, um, was a, a legal academic for a long time uh, before he decided to change routes and uh, became a, a barrister. Um, so far as solicitors are concerned, of course, it's true that <coughs> historically it was less common for solicitors to sit in the senior courts than barristers. Um, I suppose statistically, they are still in a minority, but it's much more common than it used to be. And um, they've been perfectly successful. Uh, um, when I first joined the court, for example, um, Lawrence Collins, uh, who was uh, previously a, a partner in a, a firm of solicitors, uh, was a member of this court. Um, Gary Hickenbottom, one of the most senior members of the Court of Appeal, um, spent his career as a solicitor before he uh, became a high court judge. Um, there seem to be some, so I'm not sure always how easy uh, solicitors firms make it for their partners to take the time out in order to get experience of part-time judging. Um, because obviously they're not earning money for the firm while they're doing that. But if you can um, manage to get the agreement of your firm to, to get judicial experience, then there's really no reason why solicitors shouldn't, um, shouldn't have a successful judicial career. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Lady Rose, would you like to come in on this? Yes, I, I, I think as far as academics are concerned, there are two things I'd say. The first is that um, the work of a judge is very much in the nitty gritty of the law. There is an aspect of it which has the broader uh, approach to the structure of the law, but you are always analysing legislation very closely and analysing earlier authorities very closely and getting to grips with the facts of a particular case. And I think that um, if you're an academic, you need to ensure that the areas of law that you specialise in um, do retain that rather than move to the much more theoretical or philosophical aspects of legal academic um, work. Uh, and I think linked to that is that writing articles about case analysis and um, how the law is progressing is also very useful because, as Liz said, when you apply for a judicial post, you have to provide uh, examples of your written material and an article which really does get to grips with a difficult area of the law and analyzes the cases and maybe suggests a, a way through is going to be more useful evidence of, of the necessary skills than something, as I say, of a much more theoretical or, or philosophical um, basis. Um, as uh, solicitors, uh, yes, I think it is uh, the, the career is opening up for solicitors. Um, but what I what I said in my uh, opening remarks, I think is very is very key that if you have the judiciary in mind, it's important to retain in your work, however senior you become, uh, a, a legal content to your role and not be moved into areas of managing the firm, managing client relations, um, budgeting and that kind of thing, because you're always having to think about how am I going to demonstrate that I have the skills that Liz was was outlining when she spoke. Could, uh, could, could, I, could I add, Vicky, it's just occurred to me that something I, sh I should have added is that it, um, a particularly valuable experience which um, academic lawyers and indeed solicitors can can have is working at the Law Commission. Um, not necessarily as a law commissioner, although that would be ideal, uh, but um, even working as a researcher there um, is, um, is, is something very good to have on your CV if you're thinking about um, the Supreme Court as a possible or indeed a, any senior judicial post because of, and I think for two reasons for, um, one is that you're going to get very valuable practical experience there about um, law reform, the legislative process, um, practical experience of the law to an extent which an academic working in a university might not otherwise get. You'll also, as an academic, find that there you have to work collaboratively with other people and um, that's uh, something valuable to be able to demonstrate. Um, you know, if 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 you have an academic life where you're really um, working on your own, it's going to be more difficult for you to demonstrate that you have the capacity to, as it were, um, submerge your ego, if, if you like, and be able to compromise with other judges in order to arrive at majority judgments with which you where you might not agree with every element of it. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you. Liz, I don't know if you want to come in on this question. I don't think I have anything much to add. I think I think it's been well covered, Vicky. Great. Well, I'll move on to the next question and I'll come to you first, Liz. Um, and the question is, do you experience self, did you experience self-doubt on your career path to the bench? And um, Liz, perhaps I'll, I'll ask you that question in your, your professional capacity as an organisational psychologist, and perhaps you could talk about it more broadly before I come to Lord Reid and Lady Rose to, to talk about their, their own um, thoughts about this. 
Thank you. Well, I, I can I can comment from a lay perspective, um, and uh, certainly the the issue of self doubt is a really interesting one, isn't it? And there's been there's been a lot written about um, so called imposter syndrome, um, which I think is is an aspect of of self doubt where people find themselves in roles and um, think how how have I managed to do this? Can I really do it? Am I really able to? Um, to perform at this kind of level, and it's a very well documented um, phenomenon. And I think that um, there can be differences with different groups of people. Um, sometimes it's something that's attributed to some groups rather than others. And I think that the confidence is an important thing, isn't it? Um, it confidence in many ways develops from that experience, which means that you are um, on top of your subject, you are on top of the uh, issues that you're dealing with. And I think that self-doubt is something that, although it, it's a very inherent characteristic for many people, lots of things, you can do lots of things to, to help with that. Um, we're all confident in situations where we feel well prepared, aren't we? Thank you. Um, Lord Reed, shall I come to you next? Thank you. Um, th thank you, Vicky. Um, yes, I have certainly experienced self-doubt in my career um, the, from time to time. I mean, I'm a generally fairly confident person, but um, when I first joined the Supreme Court, I felt that I was in, the, in at the deep end for about my first 18 months or so. Um, I think particularly coming as a Scots lawyer and having effectively to learn again um, areas of uh, fundamental areas of the law, like equity, for example. Um, or I remember the first case I sat on was in an area which I had never encountered before. And uh, I was asked to write the judgment on the basis that, that would be a good way of learning about it. And um, one of my colleagues presented me with a leading textbook on the subject and said that he suggested I start at page one. Um, so <laughs> you were sort of being tested by some of your colleagues. Um, it took time for me to uh, get more confident, but you know, you, um, you, you didn't. That was the most difficult experience I've had in my career. Um, and. Uh, I, I got over it, but it took a little time. Thank you. And Lady Rose, let me move to you. Yes, I, I think uh, I agree that everybody experiences this. And I think the good thing is that people are much more honest and open about their doubts. Uh, and, and that was particularly uh, if those watching of um, read Lady Hale's memoir. She highlights particular moments in her life when she felt very unsure. Uh, and so to me, it, it brought a lot of comfort that even Lady Hale has gone through uh, those sorts of experiences. Um, for me, I felt when I applied to be a recorder, uh, sitting in a, a criminal jurisdiction of the Crown Court, having never done any criminal work when I was in practice, um, that was a very steep learning curve. And I felt that once I was able to do that, that gave me a lot of confidence that anything else I tackled, I would probably be able to manage. But I would also say I get a lot of help and support from my colleagues. We've talked about how, how important the collegiality of the judiciary is. And when I came into the judiciary from a rather unconventional route and not really knowing um, people throughout my whole career, I was unsure how they were going to respond to me. And I found everyone very friendly and supportive in the High Court. Uh, everyone's in and out of each other's rooms, giving help, giving uh, boosts to confidence. Uh, and so I found it a very positive environment to work in, in which it's not difficult to express lack of confidence if I'm feeling that and to receive back a lot of warmth and friendship and support. And I find that is very valuable uh, and helpful. 
Thank you. Let me move on to the next question. And I think, um, oh, I've just lost it. Oh, here we are. And I'll, Lord Reed, I'll ask you to speak first on this. And the question is, what steps are being taken to develop and dismantle the institutional elements of the judicial selection process that might serve as a barrier to diversity and inclusion at the court? Well, I'm not sure that I would accept the premise of the question that there are institutional elements of the selection process that do serve as a barrier to diversity and inclusion. And I recognize that there are all sorts of barriers uh, to which, which affect the diversity and inclusion of the courts. And the, this court is taking steps to try to address those. I mean, this very, <laughs> this very event is one of those steps. Um, an, another one earlier this afternoon, before I started this webinar, I was addressing students, um, talking to them about possible careers. The um, last term we ran the first of a series, the first uh, internships that we've organized uh, with the assistance of an organization called Bridging the Bar uh, for underrepresented groups uh, amongst young uh, lawyers or law students who are thinking of a legal career. And they came and spent time uh, working at the court assigned to each of them assigned to a justice and a judicial assistant. Um, we are taking uh, steps here to try to um, do what we can to address barriers to diversity. It is a complex problem which has causes going well beyond the courts, uh, but we're doing what we can to address it. But so far as institutional aspects of the process are concerned, I mean, when people refer to that, I think they, 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 what they seem to be concerned about mainly seems to be the system of obtaining um, assessments from people nominated by candidates uh, who are able to comment on their ability to um, uh, meet the criteria for appointment. And from what one, what I've read, there seems to be a suspicion that the more prestigious the person you can nominate, the likelier the, your candidacy is to be successful. Um, and that then feeds into a complaint that um, that the more privileged you are, the more likely you are to be able to nominate um, uh, prestigious um, assessors. Um, that's a misapprehension. Um, we're really, um, I, I, we, we don't pay more attention to uh, assessments according to the seniority, if you like, of the uh, assessor. We're, we're concerned with how well they know the candidate, um, how well what they say about the candidate uh, can be seen to be based on evidence, um, how cogently their views are expressed. And um, I would hope that anyone who is a, a serious candidate for a judicial post would be in a position to nominate some people who are able to comment on their performance, whether it's a colleague in a solicitor's firm, a colleague at the GLD, or a colleague if you're an in-house lawyer, or, or a friend, uh, or it may be people you've come across professionally who, who are more independent than that. Um, but um, whether you nominate the Lord Chief Justice or um, somebody you, you work with every day, um, isn't in principle going to affect your chances of success. Thank you, uh, Vicky. Thank you. Um, Liz, shall I, shall I go to you next? Yes, thank you, Vicky. I, I think I, I'd just like to refer to something that Lady Rose said, because it, 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 it's important that, that everyone is able to put forward the best possible application um, that they can. And sometimes it's the case that um, 
there are many lawyers who perhaps have pro managed to progress very well without going through formal um, assessment procedures um, of, of the sort that would be involved in judicial appointments. And I think there is help available on that, and it's a really important source of help through the um, appointments commissions. And it, it, there are various things, including seminars, including guidance information, um, opportunities for mentoring programmes, uh, opportunities for perhaps um, taking part as, as a mock candidate. Um, so there are a range of different opportunities. And I think it's really important to take advantage of those because what we want is that everybody has um, an equal chance uh, of being able to give of their best. And that's the that's the way that we can really understand merit if people have really been able to give of their best. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you. Lady Rose. One thing I would add to that, which I think has been a huge change over recent years and I think is helping and will in the future help with diversity is an increasing career progression in the judiciary. It used to be that there was very little movement either between different levels of the judiciary or between the tribunal service and the and the court service. And the, the conventional route was that you were a senior barrister, you applied to become a recorder, then you became a deputy high court judge and then you became a high court judge. And that was almost exclusively the way to get to the senior judiciary. Now, increasingly, there are people who start as circuit judges who become high court judges. There are people like me who start their careers in the tribunal service and move over to the court judiciary. And if you look at the reports on, on uh, diversity, they all show that the judiciary in the, um, in the circuit, on the circuit bench in the Crown Court and in the tribunal uh, service are much more diverse than in the uh, senior court service. And so I think that that increase in movement between the different branches of the judiciary and increasingly seeing um, the, the breadth of the different steps you can take towards becoming a high court judge is, is an important development for, for increasing diversity. Thank you. And um, we're, we're almost at the end, but I'm going to squish in one final question for quick answers from our panellists, starting with Lord Reid. And, and that is, what are the highlights of your role? <laughs> well, well um, I, I very much enjoy the fact that the Royal brings me into contact with young people a great deal. We spend quite a lot of time doing outreach with universities and schools. Um, we work every day with judicial assistants who are young lawyers in their, in their 20s. And um, that's, uh, that's very enjoyable. I wouldn't otherwise have um, such contact with young people. Thank you. And Lady Rose? I think it's a wonderful job to do. And it's a wonderful job to do at the end of a career as a lawyer. I've been a lawyer you know, for many, many years now. I won't say quite how many. Um, and this is really the pinnacle of my career and I'm honored and privileged to have arrived at it. Lovely, thank you very, both very much. Um, so as we draw the webinar to a close, first of all, I'd like to thank all three panelists uh, very much, Lord Reed, Lady Rose, and Liz Burnley, thank you so much for your time and for your insights. Um, and I'm sure that everyone listening will have taken tips and advice that they can reflect on and will help them plan their career and think differently about their route to the Supreme Court. And thank you to everybody that's attended for your questions. Um, I know we didn't get to all of them and we'll think about ways of, of answering them um, other than on this web webinar. Um, it's really important for us to get your feedback on this event and there'll be a link to a very short feedback survey and we'd really appreciate you taking a couple of minutes um, to respond to that. And finally, please don't forget that you can find out more about us by visiting our website. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, 
Instagram and LinkedIn if you'd like to keep in touch and receive updates on our work. And a final plug for our new free online course, um, which takes you behind the, the scenes of the court. Um, I wish everybody a very good evening. Thank you very much for attending.